What is up, Coachable family? Welcome back to the Coachable Podcast. I'm your host, Tori Gordon, and today I'm so grateful to be joined by a returning guest, one of my absolutely favorite relationship experts. Mark Grove is here virtually tuning in from Vancouver, and I am so excited to have Mark back on the show because if you haven't listened to it, you should go back and listen to our first episode that we did a couple years back. And since then, he has become a new dad. He's gotten married. He's just released a new book that he is the co-author of called Liberated Love. And if you don't know him, he's also the, the founder of Create the Love and the host of the Mark Grove podcast. And I'm just really excited to jump in to hear about how we can truly transform our relationships. What I know to be true is that the quality of our lives is dependent on the quality of our relationships to ourselves, to each other, and to whatever we call divine. So I'm excited to dive in and see how we can come closer in relationship to ourselves and to each other. So Mark, welcome back to the show. Oh, what an intro. I'm so excited to be back. How can, I'm just going to come back again because of that intro. That's yes. so good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I love your work. I, I respect you. I admire you really, really deeply. And I think you are a mouthpiece for the next generation, the next wave, the next initiation of what love can look like on our planet and the types of connection that are really possible for us to create and curate. And, you know, I think what I love about you is that we have so many shared values. You know, I don't know you deep, like deeply on a personal level, just from so much of what you've shared and your work over the years, but, you know, I really value truth and I value alignment and I value presence and I value connection and I don't think we can have connection and intimacy in the way that we want it unless we're willing to look at the truth and face the truth. And that's what you do so well is, is gently turn us towards ourselves and the reality of the lies that we might have been uh, or illusions we might have been living under around what relationships look like, what love looks like, uh, what we should be seeking after and turn us back towards our, ourselves and our own truth. And so I want to start with you and just dive in um, to human connection. You're a human connection specialist. You really have this beautiful way of helping us to connect in ways that we aren't really used to doing, I think, and making that the norm. And where I want to start is like this loneliness epidemic that we're in. <laughs> I was looking at some of the statistics uh, earlier this week, and it's really jarring and shocking to see that now in 2024, we are so connected digitally, yet so disconnected. And it's actually having a real significant impact on our health and our well being. Um, some of those statistics being uh, that when people are socially disconnected, their risk of anxiety and depression increases, risk of heart disease goes up by 29%, dementia goes up by 50%, stroke increases by 32%, and the increased risk of premature death associated with social disconnection is comparable to smoking up to 15 cigarettes a day, drinking six alcoholic drinks a day. So we're, we're in an epidemic of social disconnection and a lack of deep intimacy. Um, what does that bring up for you as you hear those statistics probably, you know, again, and why do you think we're in this position and, and where do you see us, you know, going if we don't make a change? Oh man, what a great entry point into the importance of being in actual relationships. You know, I have over... I think over 1.2 million people that I'm connected to via social media. But if someone can have a massive social media following and be completely depressed, mm. you know, it's like seeing comedians that all of a sudden you find out that they're depressed when they take their lives. And you're like, here's someone who dedicated their life to humor. So, right. you know, really I say all that because we live in a time where, yes, we are more connected than we've ever been. But the depths of those connections, they're, they're really, uh, for the most part, so superficial. Mm -hmm. There's a number called, I think it's called Dunbar's number, but the number is the amount of intimate relationships we're actually capable of having. And it's something like 160, mm -hmm. like where we can actually know somebody yeah. and where we've actually verified our, or validated 
our credibility, our viability, our worthiness on a, a mechanism like social media. Mm -hmm. Like if you have more followers, then you're more, your art is more important. Your creativity is more important. And that's a really slippery slope. You know, I was reading recently that Snapchat has like a friend ranking oh, really? system. I didn't, I just heard about this. Um, maybe it's uh, um, been around for a while, but that is everyone's worst nightmare. Like to actually then, I remember when MySpace had yeah, like the a top, top eight. five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and just like how impacted we are by that, you know, so... The first part I'll say is that the loneliness epidemic is really indi indicative of the amount of physiological inflammation mm. that we experience when we are disconnected from one another, when we have high conflict in relationships, when we don't have to know how to be with our own feelings. And there's so many confounding reasons for that. I'd say social media is one of the largest ones, but I'd say also that if you look at kind of the parenting styles since the 90s has really been like they call it snowplow parenting mm. or helicopter parenting that there's not in some, you know, circles, I'd say more in Western, the Western world, that there is a, a desire to save people from the experience of discomfort. Yes. And so then they take that same inability to be with their own dysregulation. That dysregulation then feeds the need to be on social media platforms because social media platforms whole purpose is to, um, feed your dopamine systems and you don't stand a chance mm -hmm. against it. Like as much as you think you have discernment, it's like doing cocaine and saying, I'll never have a problem with this, mm -hmm. said every cocaine addict ever, yeah. you know? And I, I, I think it's so interesting because we've normalized, like it's normal for a, a parent to be looking at their phone instead of in their children's eyes. Mm -hmm. Like it's normal for us to spend hours a day like when people are like oh yeah I, I don't have time for that and then they get their screen report and it's a job yeah you know and and not to dismiss that for some people it, it might be their job sure yeah I mean I th I think this just goes to show that de it doesn't matter how many people you're connected with or surrounded by that doesn't necessarily mean that you are feeling the effects of, uh, like you're feeling connected. Like you can, I know what it's like to be in a crowded room of people and feel alone. Right. And I think that has been, um, in the past, that was such a catalyst for me to figure out like, how do I have real meaning full connections? And, and how do I find my people? How do I find my tribe? How do I find my person? And I think we've been sold this idea that, especially in romantic relationships, we're going to find one person and they're going to bring us all the happiness and the fulfillment and peace and all of these things. And yet so many people are out there chasing a type of relationship that they have in their head, or they're just kind of resigned and they're like, it's never going to happen. And I'm not even going to try and put myself out there because I have a story that I'll be rejected or there's no good men or there's no good women or whatever it might be. And it continues to feed this isolation that so many of us find ourselves in. And I, I know a lot of people in my world, uh, whether that I'm close to or that I work with, that are really hungry. They're craving depth and intimacy and connection, but they don't know how to go about actually finding that. Mm -hmm. What, where do you say people should start? You know, if they're like, I, I have so many messages in my DMs of uh, how, how do you find a community like yours? Or how do you find the type of friendships? I have deep relationships and friendships that are so nourishing for me. How do you find that? How do you create that? Where would you say someone should start if they're really craving it, but have no idea where to begin? Yeah, in a world where the connections just seem to be so easy to make with your phone. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It's just what you're saying. We crave deep connection, not the shallow ones. Right. So we like spend our life longing. 
but it's really because we haven't stood still and really dove into the present moment with somebody. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember reading that people in New York report higher levels of depression and loneliness and really because they're surrounded by so many more people that it just reminds them of all the missed opportunities. It reminds mm-hmm. them of all that they know we, there's nine, I forget, maybe 9 million people in New York, mm-hmm. but it's like, they're reminded of so, by so many more people being around them that they have less social connections. I remember one of the greatest predictors of your mental health in one, in like one question is, do you have someone to call at 2 a.m.? I read a statistic this week, or I think I heard it on the Aubrey Marcus podcast. They just had somebody on talking about community building. And the statistic was one in four people don't have yeah. a friend to confide in. One in four. Yeah, isn't that wild? And and I would imagine the stat is probably even higher for men. Yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, because in relationships, when there's a challenge in a person's life, women turn towards their friends around 65% of the time and men around 30%. Mm-hmm. So when a man loses his relationship, he loses his social support. Yes. Um, but all that to say, like, where do you start looking? I think... I think our throwback Thursday should really be about getting rid of our phones and actually seeing what we witness in the world. Yes. You know, I grew up in, I'm one of the last generations to know the world before social media and iPhones and all the things. And I at least have the opportunity of comparison, but imagine growing up being born into what is currently going on and thinking this is normal, but you have a nervous system and your nervous system is actually not designed to be constantly connected. Mm. It isn't. It's not designed to take on the opinions of 500 people, a thousand people, a million people. So we actually, I think one of the curses of consciousness, and maybe it's the shadow side of consciousness, is the arrogance that we're not biological beings. Mm. You know, that we might be a soul in a meat suit, but we're still in a meat suit, you know, and we're still... We still have hearts that beat and we still have spinal cords and we still have nervous systems and all these things are so important because, you know, I was interviewing Dr. Stephen Porges who created the Polyvagal Institute and Polyvagal Theory. And he was saying that in our modern world, we spend the majority of our time being evaluated. Mm. So even in school, we're being evaluated. But he said, add to that social media, which is constantly evaluating you like through likes and follows. And I was like, yeah, but even further than that, as a creator, you're being evaluated by an algorithm that will never tell you how to win. And the problem with this, which I, I wondered, why do I have such a dysregulated relationship with a platform that I feel, you know, in some level has helped support me and build a business. But on the other side, I have a lot of resentment for Mm -hmm. And I was realizing it's because the relationship is only one way. Yeah. Like in a normal relationship, you and I, if I give you feedback that I'm feeling evaluated all the time, we could talk about that. And there'd be some relational generative thing that's happening between the two of us. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, and I know this sounds trite, but it's like you can't even get a hold of customer service. Right. Because it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. It does if you're Kim Kardashian. But I have over a million followers. I can't get a hold of anyone in Meta. So it's not relational. So there's only one side to the feedback loop, and it's towards us. And we do not realize the level of injury that causes to people, Mm -hmm. especially if you say the wrong thing and you get kicked off. So it's like, where do you start? You have to evaluate what is depleting your system. Mm -hmm. Like, does it feel good Mm -hmm. to check your phone first thing when you wake up? How do you feel when you're out in the world? Are you looking down at it? Are your headphones always in? Are you always trying to consume more media, more information? Mm -hmm. And are you actually engaging in conversations with people you don't know and joining activities that bring you alive? Like whenever I go hiking, I'm always like, how is every single guy not hiking? (laughs) Like when I go to, there's a exercise place here in Vancouver called Turf. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's like a babe fest. I'm like, where are all, all the, the dudes? <laughs> like my wife and I laugh because I'm like, where, why are we not mm-hmm. getting back to that type of engagement? And because when you do things you love, that's when you meet people who are doing things they, they love. And we often think that if I forgo the things I love, then I'll meet my person. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, yeah. Yeah. And I think this comes down to a couple things. Like in my mind, it, it sends me on a couple of different pathways. One, that in order to create what you want to create, you have to know what you want. <laughs> <laughs> and what right. you don't want. And I don't know that enough people sit down with themselves and evaluate their own lives. We're constant, constantly being evaluated, but how many people sit down and evaluate themselves and their relationships and the dynamics and are, are they depleting me or are they fulfilling me? And if you can answer that question, then, and the answer is no, I'm being depleted, then I need to move in a new direction and do something different. And oftentimes I find a lot of the reason that relationships are unfulfilling or depleting is one, they're not aligned with you and your values, structure, and what you actually want to create. And you're, you're engaging with them because of obligation, because you think you have to, because you don't think you have any other options, because if you don't, you'll be alone. So I'll just take this because it's, it's, I'd rather have something versus nothing, or there's no presence like, even though you're in relationship, you're disconnected and that's lonely in itself. And like we were saying earlier, I, I reflect all of this back in my own life. And I was like, when have I felt those ways and what shifted for me? And part of it, the biggest thing that's happened for me over the last year is deepening my level of presence with myself. Mm -hmm. And then with the people that are in front of me, wherever I am, whether it's romantic or friendships or anything, it's like, am I actually where my feet are? Am I actually engaging in the moment, in this conversation fully, or am I actually in the meeting that I have later on down, you know, in the day or whatever else I'm thinking about? Because I can only connect to the degree that I'm present for that connection to occur. And it, that takes two people, you know, I can be present and you can be out, you know, not there and there's not going to be... The frequency is like, I'm on the line, but you're not picking up, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think about people using their, you know, when in research, when someone has their phone facing down at a table, they're less vulnerable mm -hmm. in the conversation because they're unconsciously being drawn to more. Mm -hmm. Like there's a possibility that I have more connection. Someone might be saying something to me. I really think we're going to look back and be like social media it was the smoking mm. of the 2020s mm. and the and the 20 teens. Yeah. I really do because you look at the absolute mental health crisis that's going on and you know Gabor Mate's book The Myth of Normal is like really saying this is an appropriate response to these circumstances. I think about someone who's experiencing disconnection in their relationships, who's feeling depleted, who has anxiety, who has depression. And I'm like, look, no one's coming to save you. Mm. Like no social media company is going to put in a guardrail for you. Like you have to be the curator of your attention. And you also have to pay attention to what's going on in your body, which mm -hmm. is a canary in a coal mine. It's saying this is not working. So the way that we're brought towards change and personal growth generally is something's wrong. And I need to change it. Mm -hmm. I did something wrong. I am something wrong. I made a bad choice. I lost somebody. I lost myself. But the problem with that is that we start to orient to growth from a place of deficit. Mm -hmm. And that can get you there, which I don't think that's the problem. That's the rock bottom, right? That's like, I'm the addict. I'm the whatever. I'm divorced. Whatever's happening. But it's like... That's not going to get us to the place where we start to turn towards growth and information like your podcast from a place of like, actually, I'm good. Mm -hmm. The reason I'm depressed is because my relationship sucks or that I don't have a great relationship with food or whenever I have a feeling about my phone feeling heavy, I log into it. Mm -hmm. So like my response, the depressive experience is the depression and the repression of emotion, mm -hmm. even anxiety. I think about anxiety a lot about the, the pathology of it in that Anxiety is an inhibitory feeling. It is what we feel when we can't feel and express one of our core emotions, mm -hmm. or we're having a bunch of them at the same time and they collapse on each other. So 
what happens is if you don't have access to choice, like real choice, like I, I want that glass of wine, I'm not going to have it. Like I have a friend who told me they get really anxious all the time when they drink. Mm. And I was like, well, why don't you just stop drinking? Well, no, it's not that. Well, I, we just did A plus B equals C. So right. I guess, but I'm like, they're not ready. Mm-hmm. They're not ready to give up the thing. I think about what Carola May says, like, you'll get a message from God and then you'll go looking for the message to be anything what, what you got. Yep. So it's like, you'll be told, hey, like, if you really want to step into your power, you got to quit sugar. And it's like, are you going to be willing to actually give the thing up? And yep. it's like most of us are not willing to give up the thing that's actually holding us back from the very thing we want. And I say all of that because the only way to start is one, the first thing you said, you have to be able to do an accurate audit of your life and who you are. And secondly, and it can only start after step one, because without step one, you can't change anything because you're not exo- acknowledging what's real mm-hmm. and what's true. So then step two is like, okay, well, all of this stuff that's now in my life is here because I'm saying yes to it. Yes. Okay. Do I want to say yes to it anymore? Right. What's going to be the impact on the people in my life? Have I spent the majority of my life actually being totally unhappy and living in environments that don't feel good because I don't want to hurt other people's feelings? Mm-hmm. So I spend my whole life laying on a bed of nails while everybody else gets a sweet postopedic <laughs> memory foam mattress and I'm doing it and I get to be the martyr of all of it. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing is I think the hardest paradox to hold is that you can simultaneously be a victim of systems, of the world, of life, of family, of culture, of media. And at the, and at the very same time, you have to choose your way out of it. Like you, you can hold this strange juxtaposition of like their opposing forces. One is it's not fair. And the other one is fuck it. Mm -hmm. We better change our shit. Like, okay, it isn't fair, but ain't nobody going to put like, we want somebody else to put a monitor on our phone with a limit on our social media. And then we just bypass it anyway. Give me 15 more minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, what you're talking about is, the way I've, I've learned exactly what you're talking about is like one of the hallmarks of trauma is choicelessness. Yeah. Right. Not having agency, not having our sovereignty, it's having that taken from us. And really all of us are traumatized coming into the world. Cause we didn't choose unless you want to have a spiritual approach to it is like where you grew up, what side of the, you know, what zip code, how much money your parents made, what color of your skin you have, et cetera. And those are things that you come pre-installed with that you have to deal with. Um, you know, as a child, you might not have had a choice of whether you were neglected or abused or, or loved and nurtured in the ways that you deserved. But now so many of us take that victimhood mentality into our lives and our relationships. And it's just like this, I just have to accept what is given to me. I just have to tolerate this and endure this versus now I'm an adult with agency and sovereignty and I can decide Maybe not what happened to me, but what I do about it and what yeah, I want, exactly. if I'm going to continue to recreate this and actually become the perpetrator of the abuse myself and abuse myself and neglect myself, or am I going to choose a new path and do something different? But recognizing that you have choice inevitably re- requires you to step into self-responsibility. Right. Now, if I realize I have a choice, then I actually have to be accountable for doing something about it. Right. 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 And many of us would rather stay in this retracted, contracted state of like, I don't want to be responsible for my life, um, even though I'm living out the consequences of all my choices every single day. Um, And those might not always be pleasant. And to look at that is very confronting, but it is like something none of us can get like out of participating in and doing if we want to actually create the relationships that are possible. And I think even so many people are probably like, oh, real love, real connection, that level of intimacy is only for fairy tales or only for the movies. And I know enough about you to know, and even my own life, that I've accessed a level of depth and connection and love in ways 
it only keeps getting better. <laughs> like it just keeps getting right. better and better and deeper. And I want people to experience that so badly. And really I want them to be exactly what you talk about in your book, liberated love, liberated from these mental prisons and ideas of ourselves, of relationships that keep us small and stuck in positions and relationships that aren't serving and that are harmful to not just our psyches, but to our health, you know, um, I'd love for you to talk about the book a little bit, liberated love. Like what does that mean? Uh, what, how do you define liberated love and how is it different than maybe the love that we've been brought up believing in? Well, I'd say that the majority of the relationships that are modeled for us are codependent and we know the word codependency more from the space of addiction. Mm -hmm. So really popularized by the very amazing book by Melody Beattie called Codependent No More which is really more based on Al-Anon and Al-Anon for people listening or watching is to support people in relationship with people uh, with active addiction or in recovery. So we, we define codependency in our book as any relational dynamic where we source safety from something or someone at the cost of our own needs, our own sense of self, our, our overall well-being. Mm -hmm. So at the expense of is really the key words. It's mm -hmm. like at the expense of ourselves. And, you know, I, I was just thinking as you were speaking too, it's like depression is the exact appropriate response to living a life of chronic self-abandonment. <sighs> like how could you be excited about your life when you don't even know you have your own back? Like that's why, like how can you direct your life without choice? Of course, anxiety is going to be the natural response. If every time I'm in a conversation with someone or not, but wanting to have one, and I'm afraid of how they're going to respond, then, and, and so I don't self-express, I'm going to resent them. Mm -hmm. I'm going to feel powerless. And what we're saying is like, liberated love is about a fierce dedication to the truth. It's about really honoring that there are two people with two paths. Mm -hmm. Obviously, from the most romantic ideal, that would be that those paths walk alongside each other till death do us part. We invite a different thought, which is that, which, and that really morphs both paths into one. And that one also requires that there isn't an honoring that sometimes love leaves. Mm. Sometimes relationships end, but, you know, love is still present in the relationship ending. We've been taught that love is conditional. Love is only that you, as long as you obey the commitments we made to each other when we were 21 or 24 or whatever, when we didn't know what we know today. Most of our relational dynamics are the skills that are required are not the skills that we have. You know, so we in the book argue that or, or make the, the suggestion that we're using old world skills for new world relationship desires. Mm -hmm. And we're not saying we don't want people to be together or we don't want people to create amazing, epic relationships. That's actually exactly what we want. But the counterintuitive pathway to that is actually to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. It's to be like, I miss you, mm -hmm. or I take you for granted, or I feel taken for granted, or I've forgotten about me. You know what? When I told you that I was okay with giving that thing up, I actually said that because I was afraid you'd leave me. We're talking about when you make a commitment to somebody, you're actually making a commitment to yourself in the same moment. If choosing somebody else is not synonymous with choosing yourself, that's not love. Mm -hmm. That's conditional love and it's self-abandonment and it's codependency. Mm -hmm. And if, if someone needs to stay with you so that you maintain your well-being and your happiness, that's not their responsibility. That's beautiful. Relationships obviously contribute to our well-being. They are, are incredibly beneficial for our health. But they are not beneficial when they require self-abandonment. They are not beneficial when there's an avoidance of conflict. Because even in the research from the Gottmans, when a couple that has a high level of stress, conflict in their relationship are not even arguing, are not even talking, mm -hmm. their bodies are in a dysregulated state. It's also shown that high conflict relationships um, actually delay healing. They impair healing. So... 
what we're proposing is what's good for the body. The body wants to know that people are reliable. There's two questions we're always asking relationally. One is, am I safe? Mm -hmm. And that's every type of relationship. And the second one is, am I safe to be myself? Right. But if number one is threatened by number two, we don't do number two. So if me actually being authentic and, and being myself threatens safety, and that is both emotional and physical, and, and, and which can just be recreated from a childhood experience. Right. Like I could have a parent who was really reactive as a, when I was a kid, and then I'm in a relationship with someone who's not reactive. But because I haven't worked through and explored my childhood and my overly sensitized hypervigilance, which is the exactly appropriate response to the childhood then I might push away people and, and resent them when I actually have never brought my full self forward. So our book really looks at all the tools. It tells the story of my wife and I's relationship, 1.0, which we were together four years, and then we broke up and the relationship was over. We call that the sacred pause, which is what you can call a breakup when you get back together. Otherwise, it's just a breakup, sorry. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then the 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 second or the third part, relationship 2.0. And so we overlay all the tools and self-awareness and, and necessary how-tos to move from this sense of codependency um, into this place of interdependency. Because the opposite of codependency and the thought when we start to heal from self-abandonment is that we're going to, you know, that's just selfish. Now you're just going to be someone who's so self-centered. And, and listen, the natural response to even starting to develop a self and think about yourself mm -hmm. is you're going to feel guilt. Mm -hmm. And so we talk a lot about these different things that are going to come up. But the opposite of, or the healing of codependency is not eradicating, is not, sorry, is not only having your own needs and values and, and, and wants met. It's actually, how can I hold on to who I am and be in a relationship with another person, have positive regard for what they need and want, and that through the relationship, we actually um, provide for both, mm -hmm. that, that the relationship itself comes, becomes a place of healing. So the frictions that come up between us. So if you're single and you're like, wait, what about if you're single? The things that come up for you when you're dating, when you're, when you're exploring relationship are the exact things that need to come up to be able to heal so we can enter into a state of, of um, interdependency, of liberated love. Yeah, this, there's so much in what you just said. I love the two things you were saying about the questions we're asking ourselves in relationship. Am I safe and am I safe to be myself? And I think back to, you know, for so many of us in, in childhood, if we learned that it's not safe to be ourselves, we will create maladaptive coping strategies so that we can create safety, even though if we have right. to abandon being ourselves in order to be safe. And then we take that into our relationships as adults where we learn it's not safe to be myself, but in order to be safe with you, I have to abandon myself so I can maintain connection. And that's where this, these codependent relationships, you know, get established and, and shifting that to where, how can I honor myself, stay grounded in myself, know what I need for, to begin with, actually become aware of what my needs are, have the courage to express that and to share that. Even if there's fear of you might leave me present. It doesn't mean the fear goes away. We just become more equipped to handle the relational discomfort and not let fear be in the driver's seat and determine what how we're going to show up, right? And I think as we become more aware and we become more relationally mature, we realize that the security that we crave is actually found in our taking care of ourselves, <laughs> not in someone else being in proximity to us. You know, this is something I've worked deeply on is like, I thought love was closeness. I thought love was proximity that if you were spending time with me, if you're close with me, that mean we, we have love. I didn't realize that that was actually not love. It was codependency because I was neglecting myself in order to keep that closeness, right? right? And so moving into what you talk about in your 2.0 relationship with Kylie, or, uh, with Kylie is that like, it's 
about how do we let truth be our North star, right? And even if that truth means we're about to have to have a discussion that's really challenging. And I think that's you guys, from what I know and from hearing kind of your story is truth was the reason you even got to the breakup to begin with. <laughs> Cause you were willing to be honest that this, we need to go separate ways so we can both honor each other and honor ourselves and what we need at this point. And sometimes that truth sends you in a path that's like, that's hard, that's sad, that requires a lot of grieving and goodbyes. And we, we all get excited about what do we want to create? What do we want to create? What do we want to experience? But we forget the other side of that, of creation is destruction. <laughs> what right. needs, what needs to be broken down and let go of and surrendered. And that, that challenges our attachment to things. And why are we holding so tightly, gripping so tightly to the people or the experiences or the ways that we've been? And I think it brings up so much fear, but it's, we're liberated when we actually allow ourselves to look at that fear and find that and source that love and that safety from within. Because otherwise we're always going to be looking for someone or something to save us and fix us. And we're, we're naturally going to be dependent on them for our own, yeah, for our, for our well being. Yet we're not we're living at a very muted level of true well being because it's not real. <laughs> it's not authentic. It's outsourced to someone else. And when we outsource our safety or our peace or our joy, we're always at the risk of losing it. Because what happens, mm. you know, if if the relationship ends? And this is what I want to talk to you about is like this idea of safety that relationships give us. Cause I was having this conversation with somebody I love recently and I was asking her, I was like, why do you, why do you choose to be in a relationship? Like, what does a relationship give you that you, and I've been thinking about this. What is a, what would a relationship give me that I don't already have? Cause I've worked really hard to get to a point where I can like, I have deeply nourishing friendships and family relationships and community. And I feel so loved and so fulfilled. I'm like, what would a relationship add that I don't already have? And she was saying, well, it gives me safety and security. And I think we have this idea that a relationship is going to provide you with a safety of security that, or what we're looking for is a guarantee, mm -hmm. a guarantee that like we're, going to be in this dynamic and this dance from now on and that I'm going to source my security and safety from you. But the truth is what I've come to realize is somebody who's been in relationships that I thought were deeply, like I was completely committed that even those can end just because I've said, you know, I'm in this with you doesn't mean that somebody can't change their mind and leave. So I think it's important to kind of discuss that because so many of us have bought into this idea that a relationship is going to give you safety and security, but you and I both have been in relationships where those have ended. And then what happens to your safety and security then? You know? Right. Yeah. I, you know, I think there is an element that, for example, if I was afraid of a relationship ending, imagine if I just brought that truth to the relationship. Mm, mm -hmm. Like I'm afraid if I'm going to tell you this or share this or we're ask you to read Liberated Love or listen to this episode with Tori and Mark, like I'm I'm worried that you're going to pull away. Mm -hmm. And now we have the real the real material there of maybe there's truth in that, right? Maybe the person actually is someone who pulls away when intimacy is close. Mm -hmm. Ah, so we could bring that forward. And maybe I do hold on to the things I really want to say. But can I be with the reality that I'm afraid you're going to leave? And if I'm afraid you're going to leave, then how else does that impede me showing up? fully as myself. Usually it's an old story that's living in the relational choices we're making. You know, like if mm -hmm. I had someone who wasn't available or around, I'm likely drawn to people who are distant, who are not around. Because unconsciously what I'm wanting to do is to actually complete the healing in that relationship dynamic. Mm -hmm. It seems like a painful trick though that the psyche is like, oh, let's draw us into our most wounding experience so we can then resolve the wound. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that is right. 
Because really what it's saying is you want someone to be present and someone to finally choose you. But really what you're longing for, which was from an adult, is actually for you to own how you're showing up in a dynamic and can you be present and choose yourself. Mm -hmm. That way you stop pursuing relationships from a place of wounding where you're looking for someone to give you something. You give it to yourself and then now the relationship doesn't require the wounding. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to move from this place of orienting to our relationships from a place of wounding. It's very similar to what I said earlier, that we turn towards personal growth from a place of deficit. Yeah, It's the same idea. It's like, but imagine if I turn towards my relationships from a place of wholeness, from a place that like through these experiences, I'm actually going to pick back up pieces of me that I gave away in relationship. And how do we begin to source safety and security? Well, one when we're in a relationship dynamic, we're co-creating safety and security. Mm -hmm. So can I be with the things about them that I don't like? Can I be with, you know, their vulnerabilities? Can I actually allow them to show up as themselves? Mm -hmm. Now, granted, I want to always add a caveat to this. People who are prone to being in relationships with narcissists or abusive relationship dynamics often will think, oh, I just need to give them more opportunities. So they're disconnected from the ability to really be honest about the types of relationships and what they tolerate. Mm -hmm. So being able to develop the ability to be discerning about the people you welcome into your life is about coming back into connection with your intuition and your nervous system, mm -hmm. coming back into connection with your body. If we're used to being in relationship with people like that, most often it's because of our childhood. It's because of some sort of relational dynamic in our childhood. Could be due to abuse, could be due to many things. Mm -hmm. But it's the, the resolution is about actually getting back in touch with regulating the nervous system. So whenever we're doing change, whenever we're like navigating a transformation, we need to be well resourced. So, you know, if I say to, let's just sort of call out a typical relationship pattern between men and women, especially from, let's say, the 80s, 70s, 60s, would be like the male's the provider and the woman is the stay-at-home person. Mm -hmm. um, what happens is, is there's an inherent power dynamic because if this woman now uses her voice and steps fully into her power, she might lose the relationship, but the relationship is actually what puts shelter over her head and food on the table. So we don't want to dismiss that and just say, well, just do it. Just like It's like saying to someone, just quit your job and pursue your dream. It's like, well, you still need to be well-resourced. Mm -hmm. You know, that sounds like a romantic story with a job because all of a sudden you're like, and I lived on the street for a little while, but then now I'm a billionaire and I had a computer's I built in a garage, right? Like that sounds great, but there's a lot of better ways to do it. Mm -hmm. Just like if you're leaving or changing or shifting relationship, it's important that you're both internally and externally resourced internally, meaning you're developing the skills to be able to share how you feel. You're developing the skills to know what a boundary is. Mm -hmm. You're also starting to become really in touch with how your body feels. So maybe you're doing breath work. Maybe you're doing meditation. Maybe you're hanging out. If, if we're talking about a woman or a man, you're hanging out with other people, other women and other men who are regulated, mm -hmm. you know, who, who are like, that's, you should not tolerate that. We've got you. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the loneliness epidemic. We can't, if we're really making big shifts, it's important that we find people that will allow us. That's that external resource. Yeah. One is being able to have money, right? To be able to pay rent if you need to leave something. Um, but actually, you know, I think about my wife and I's relationship dynamic. Um, right now I'm providing because she's taking care of our son. And so the real conversation isn't, um, I just pay for stuff and and she just lives because I know that there's an inherent dynamic that can live underneath that. So what we do is we bring what is true, what exists, but we bring it and we make it explicit. So what I would say to her is, hey, what would you need in order to feel powerful, mm. in order to feel like you have sovereign choice and you can use your voice and that this power dynamic is actually not something that you have to give up anything for? Mm-hmm. 
And for she might say, you know what? I actually need a bank account that has this amount of money in it. That would feel really good and nourishing for me. Now, because I'm not taking it personally, because I recognize it's a power dynamic, it's not personal. I could be like, that sounds great. Okay, let's do that. And I'll have no access to that. And you just have that. See, because what we're doing is we're resourcing for each other. Mm-hmm. There's no need for me. I'm, I'm actually hearing what is probably an inherited pain, right? Because you don't have to look far up your matrilineal line to see a wounding where there's self-abandonment. And you wouldn't have to see far up your patrilineal line for wounding either. So what we're doing through our relationship is actually healing that. Yeah. Yeah. And saying what you're afraid of, what you need matters. So sor- safety and security is one source from access to your own voice mm-hmm. and to your no. You have to have access to your no. And I'd say also really access to your sacred rage, to yeah. anger. Yeah. Um, and then two is actually through the relationship that you're creating, co-creating agreements mm-hmm. about how you handle conflict, how you handle... Um, Uh, disagreements, like as soon as someone puts a relationship on the line, that's a no go. That's a, that's a complete eradication of trust and it's a massive power play Yeah, and no one will ever be able to vulnerably open up when the relationship could be taken away from them in any moment. So if you're listening and you do that, stop it. Yeah. And actually look at what you're afraid of actually confronting. And you're completely deteriorating the safety of the relationship. Yeah, I yeah. polled my community when um, I knew you were coming on here and asked, you know, some, some of the people in my um, in my community what they wanted me to ask you about, about relationships. And many of them, you know, express, there was a couple of things that came up. One is, do you have any advice for people who've been in long-term partnerships? Maybe they, they met when they were in their early twenties. Now they're at the, their late twenties, early thirties, and their values have changed. Their, mm-hmm. who they are as people have evolved and changed. They're not in a relationship with the person that they were, you know, when they met, um, do you have advice for people who are, you know, they're continuing to grow as individuals and as a couple and these dynamics are shifting, you know, what was, isn't what is now and how can you continue to, um, stay connected to your partner as your needs change, as your values change in different seasons of life um, and maintain that alignment together as, yeah, as maybe you stepping into to fatherhood and, and she's stepping into motherhood. There are d- new things you need, you know, um, mm-hmm. that maybe you didn't before. How do you guys, um, you know, continually, uh, one, look at meeting your own needs as they shift, but like, how do you, how do you stay in relationship with somebody as when things have shifted over time? Yeah, it's such a good question because of course, for someone listening or watching who's been through that or feels disconnected from their partner is like, have we brought forward that truth to the relationship? Mm -hmm. You know, often you'll have people who really are like, yeah, I would like to figure out how to keep this going, but I feel like misalignment. Like what we connected on in the beginning, we don't connect on anymore. (laughs) And you see this happen a lot, especially in people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, because when they got married, they sometimes got married for very different reasons. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they got married for religion. Some, you know, they got married to have sex. I mean, that happens. So it's like what you want can change and it does. So I'm just acknowledging the truth. What you choose can change and what you value can change. So can we have the conversation in the relationship about these changing things? Mm -hmm. So in the book, we propose this idea of a sacred pause being built into, like if you're single, you take a sacred pause. It's really about stopping your old patterns, being in the space between, and then creating new patterns and agreements together. And so as a couple, it's really like, if you read the book together, it would be then about creating a space to actually imagine something different. Mm. Imagine something new. Because a lot of us are like, well, I can't do 40, 50, 60 more years in this dynamic. And if I do, I'm going to get depressed and anxious and I'm going to resign to life. I'm going to put on weight. Things are going to happen. So instead, what we propose is that you actually bring forward that the things that are currently happening, you've really loved or maybe not the relationship that's gotten you here. 
but you really want to build something with them and create something new. Mm -hmm. Now, the other reality to this is you might not want to. Yeah. So you also have to be with that truth. You know, like one of the key components for any couples therapy coaching change for a couple is asking, do you want to do the work? Do you want to change? Mm -hmm. And sometimes the answer is no. And it's like, okay, well, if they don't want to change, do you want to be in a relationship with them anymore? And you get to decide that. Mm -hmm. So these are all necessary conversations. And really, they're loving conversations. How does that rub up against what about a? I made a commitment, right? I made a commitment. I made a vow. I, you know, and I know you recently got married. Um I'm curious, you know, when you have that revelation, you're like, this isn't, I, ha I will have something n new that I want to explore. And I want to do that with you, but you can say no. Now, what does that mean? And if you do say no, but I have a commitment, do I now just have to forego, forego this desire, this want, and for, for the sake of the commitment? Or is that when, you know, it's appropriate to, to exit the relationship, to honor yourself? Well, you know, it really comes back to the word commitment. What does a commitment mean? Mm. You know, does a commitment mean that I'm going to be with you um, at the cost of everything? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to spend the rest of my life depressed mm -hmm. because I made a vow to you mm -hmm. when I made a promise when I didn't know what the promise meant, mm. or I made a promise under different circumstances. Yeah. You know, an easy way to think about this is like, imagine if you're in a relationship with someone and then they develop a really you know, a, a, an addiction or they start maybe getting a sex addiction and sleeping with lots of people is your commitment to see it through, you know, and everyone gets to decide. I don't get to say it is or is not, mm -hmm. but I would argue that if you're really part of being in a relationship with an addict, the unhealthy part of it is enabling. Mm -hmm. It's actually by dishonoring your own boundaries that you don't teach them to honor their word. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I had a friend recently who's partner has relapsed many, many times. And they said to me, well, they don't keep their word. And I said, well, neither do you. Mm. And what do you mean? Well, you've told me six times you're going to leave them when they relapse. You've never left. Oh, oh, I never thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're just modeling the exact same behavior. They're the problem because they're the addict, quote unquote, they're the problem. But really, our relationship to the person who's not changing is just as much the problem. A lot of what happens for codependent people, and we're talking more on the enabling side, because on the other side that inevitably always patterns with that behavior is someone who identifies as a problem. Mm -hmm. The only way the person can stop being a problem is when people stop orienting to them from a place that they're a problem. Yeah. So if all of a sudden I say, listen, you're a sovereign being, I think you're capable of change and transformation. I will no longer participate in your addictive behavior. I'm no longer going to enable it because this is costing me my well-being. Mm -hmm. And then what we start to do, the addiction to needing other other people to need us has to be dealt with. So when we're talking about you made a commitment, to me, that statement is usually a shame-based statement. Mm -hmm. And it usually its origins is in things obligation. like religion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's in things like religion, obligation in, in culture. And it's because the person saying it has dishonored their own needs and wants mm -hmm. and passions and has self-abandoned and that has become normalized. And so instead of witnessing and seeing the power that comes from someone saying, my commitment is to truth, my commitment is to love, my commitment is to treating this relationship as sacred, which means treating myself as sacred, why would anybody want anything else? Mm -hmm. Like... If I was in a relationship with you and I said, this relationship, I want it to be the place that your dreams are fed, that you are fueled to become everything that you want. Imagine saying that to someone and they're like, nah. Yep. No one's going to say no unless they just don't want it. And that's fine because they're like, that sounds like a lot of work. Like, I just like watching football. I don't really want to deal with it. You want to talk all the time. Mm -hmm. It's like, great then maybe we're not aligned. Yeah. The, th the beautiful thing about saying to someone, do you want to? Because when 
we start to grow, often our partners get afraid of our growth because the fear is that we're going to grow away from them. Yes. So if we can actually start to express that we desire to grow and here's the direction we're going and we'd really like them to join us, now we're giving them choice. If they say no, then we have to decide, is that a fit for us or not? Mm -hmm. Also, sometimes we can want the people we're in relationship with to love everything we love. Mm -hmm. But that ain't going to happen. You know, and there's something good about having unique perspectives and unique passions, mm-hmm. etc. I think where we start to bump into things is when we start to have we start to have differences in values. Yeah. I would also argue that values and politics have started to become a little too muddied. Mm. And so we actually infer that if you believe a certain thing, then you're no, they've become moralized. Mm. So it's like, if you don't believe this, then you're a bad person yes. and you're likely a left winger or a mm-hmm. right winger. And so I think in families, that's actually become... And in couples, yeah, I've seen that now become a very huge place of division. How did you, before you got married and in, in your relationship, how do you guys as a couple orient towards commitment and what made you guys decide to commit through the act of, of actually going through and getting married versus just being in partnership? Has, has anything changed from you from being a partner to becoming a husband and mm. how, ha- how do you guys orient to commitment? What does that mean in, in the context of your relationship? I'm curious. Well, there's an acknowledgement that my wife could leave me at any moment. I mean, that's just true. Mm-hmm. You know, so we don't want to acknowledge these types of truths, mm-hmm. but it's true. It's just like you said, like you could be fully committed to someone and they could decide that they don't want to be committed to you anymore. Mm-hmm. But a huge qualifier for me to be in a relationship with someone is that they want to be in a relationship with me. If they don't want to, then I'm actually not interested in it anymore. And you I know, know I so many people who are in relationships with people who don't really want to be there, but feel obligated to be there. <laughs> yeah. And like, why would why you would want you? <laughs> exactly. somebody who feels obligated to be in a relationship with you? Mm-hmm. Because to me now we're like, oh, great. I still have them. But they don't even want to be there. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if my wife one day was like, this is what I need to do to bring myself, you know, to reclaim whatever she's desiring. Mm-hmm. I can say that's really painful for me and hard to hear, you know, is there any resolution? Is there not? But it is, I will never ask her to compromise what she most wants to bring into the world for me Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. it's not going to be a winning proposition, no matter what. I might say, listen, I'm willing to fight for this. Are you or are you not? It's that black and white for for me. And if they say no, then I'm not. Well, why it would just be reliving my wounds to fight for things right. that don't want to fight for me. I'm not interested in it. And I think for, you know, for us, because our relationship, we've, when we broke up, it really was me saying to her, like, look, this is what I want to create. And if you want to create it, great. I want to create it with you. But if you don't, I love you. Mm-hmm. Like you're free to go. And it was actually through our departing where we did a closing ceremony and we had, there was so much love there. I didn't, she needed to leave and I needed to leave. Like, and if one person needs to leave, the other person does. It's just, that's the way it works. That's just how it goes. Like one all of a sudden takes a left here and I'm still going right. We're not in life together. Mm -hmm. So it's like, can I be with that truth and actually find a way to leave it with grace, yeah. with reverence, yeah. with being that there's space for my pain, there's pay, space for my rejection, there's space for their guilt, there's space for their shame, and that the love didn't go anywhere. Mm-hmm. Because of that, that really prepared us to come back together in liberated love because it was like, if this relationship ever ended, there would still be love. And right. what that does is it liberates us because now we're like, wait, no matter what, there's always love. Right. And that actually becomes this foundation for everything's possible because also when I can say, hey, you could leave in any moment, which means you choose to be here, 
which means I choose to be here too because I could leave. So now we're two people who are choosing to be here. How would we have to show up to ensure those choices? Mm -hmm. Now you stop taking each other for granted, you know? And so there's a quote from Jordan Peterson that I really love, which I'm sure people have mixed uh, opinions on Jordan Peterson, but this quote is fantastic. It's, Commitment only works when you do it. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's been a really guiding. It's like, do I feel different towards my wife since we got married? No, but yes, in that uh, the act of celebrating it, the act of consecrating it with a sacred, with a ceremony consecrating it. <laughs> that sounds funny. It's like the sweet love making. We never did. Mm-hmm. She was eight months pregnant when we got uh, married. So clearly we'd consecrated the wedding before yeah. the wedding occurred, um, which I laughed because I grew up Catholic. So I was like, uh, you know, that saying is like, I made an honest woman out of her. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. we're like the epitome of uh, of a, a bad Christian wedding, you know, where the wife's pregnant. Mm. But yeah, we, it was really beautiful. I was so excited to be able to you know, it was just the two of us, a friend of ours who's licensed to marry people in Arizona, and then two friends who were living near Sedona that we called to be our witnesses. Mm. And, you know, I'd always thought like, oh, maybe I'll have a big wedding one day. But to be honest, I I didn't care. Maybe the older I got, it just didn't matter. But I did want to celebrate it. Yeah. Yeah. That's so beautiful. And, you know, I think for all of us, if we're just able to, yeah, come into deeper relationship with the truth, then we can come into re- deeper relationship with each other, not out of obligation, not out of fear, but out of real love. And it, so much of what you just said reminds me of a quote. I've heard you requote someone else. I can't remember in the moment who it was. Um, it'll, I'll remember later, but it's like, there's no such thing as one way liberation, right? If oh, I- yeah. You know, if I honor what's true for me, it actually also liberates you. And I say this all the time. It's like what we think might hurt somebody actually might help them more. Right. (laughs) Right. Right. Leaving this relationship we're so scared is going to hurt you. It actually is going to help them actually go find, like have the space to find somebody who actually wants to be there and show up in the ways that they need, you know. Yeah. And, and, and this idea of how you do one thing is how you do everything is so relevant because if you, I just, I'm a firm believer that the material that gives us access to healing and, and liberation, when I say liberation, I mean like really living a life that is not self-centered, but centered around who you are, centered around your values, centered around your integrity, your alignment. And the more you're in that, the more nourishing you are to everything in life. Mm including life, including the earth. And I think a lot about how how powerful is it to honor that level of reverence, to have that level of reverence for someone you're in relationship with. That quote that you're talking about is from um, Elizabeth Gilbert. Right. She says it to Glennon Doyle mm-hmm. in her book. Um, and I think about that level of potency of like, Oh yeah, like if something is not for them, it's not for me. And one of the principles of liberated love is that if something's coming up for one of us, it's coming up for both of us. We just might not be able to sense that. Mm -hmm. And so there's this, that idea of mutual positive regard is that there's brilliance in your, your wounds. There's brilliance in your triggers. There's brilliance in your suffering and the more we can start to say to our partner, like, I really hear you. I hear you. I hear that that's coming up for you. I don't understand it. I actually, I'm not even sure that I agree with it, but your world matters to me. And there's one of my favorite quotes from the Gottmans Mm. is when you're hurting, the world stops and I listen. And I'm like, yeah, that's it. Repair, repair, repair. And liberated love is about taking these ruptures that are going to happen and actually really prioritizing repair. And that builds equity and, and trust. And it's really saying like, like when I think about challenges my wife and I have, like, for example, having a kid brings its, <laughs> brings its a few, it brings a few, uh, is like, as I, I'm, 
I don't plan on going anywhere. I'm committed to this relationship. There's a mutual sense of growth and feedback and safety. Like, where would I go that is going to provide the same thing with the same level of um, experience that we've built together? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, when I consider that, a fluctuation of six months is really nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, a challenge of, I mean, we have a one-year-old now, so it's like, a lot of that year was really hard. Yeah. Not to mention the world has been in a total space of fuckery. So you sure. have like all of these things happening yeah. and um, it, having someone is obviously a powerful way to walk through those things together. And to add a note for the people who are single, um, the greatest predictor of your health outcomes is the quality of your relationships, but it's actually not romantic. It's all relationships. All so friendships, you know, coming back to what you said about the loneliness epidemic. We might identify ourselves as lonely and loneliness actually has quite a narcissism to mm. it. And what I mean by that is it really, its whole purpose is to further isolate, mm. to say no one else will understand me. Um, but I promise you that if you share with someone what you're going through, <laughs> people will understand you because yeah. humans don't have that much complexity to no, their challenges. No, we're so much more alike than we are different. Yeah. yeah. I have so many questions I would like to ask, but in lieu of time, I do want to explore one other topic with you, which is unconditional love in conditional mm -hmm. relationships. <laughs> is it a possibility? Is it a reality to experience unconditional love? Because everybody is like, oh, what do I, I want unconditional love. Yet there are a lot of conditions on the relationships that we're in. Is that a reality we can experience? And if so, what does that actually look like? Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Well, I'd say the cultural message about unconditional love is is misconstrued with unconditional tolerance. Mm. So the ideal environment for love to flourish is not one where there's abuse, is not one where there's no safety. So when someone hears, well, I thought you loved me, or I thought, you know, you unconditionally loved me, you know, think about families. Uh, if you get divorced in certain religions, all of a sudden your family will no longer mm -hmm. talk to you. Mm -hmm. You're no longer part of the religion. Uh, I mean, there's plenty of those. That's not unconditional love. Mm -hmm. You know, and we could say, well, yeah, they have conditions, conditions to be part of the religion. Sure. So we have to decide what values do we want to adhere to. I think there's a real dangerous part when, one, when we don't set standards for ourselves. So it's like unconditional love without standards is just blind love. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, you know, we need to have standards around where we're directing our love. Mm -hmm. But like I said about my wife and I, when our relationship ended, Love was still present, but I was not going to tolerate right. ambivalence. Right. Right. So there was so much love. There was actually more love born through that, mm -hmm. through the recognition that I had access to my voice to finally choose something. And she had access to her voice too. So the other thing that's really, because if you think about it in the context of religion, it's like, okay, here we have someone who's now broken a rule of the religion and they're losing a sense of belonging and connection. What I find is then we usually end up, although we feel like the black sheep of the family and it's not to minimize the actual level of pain that comes with exile from a community, um, group behavior and group behavior norms are the way that we manipulate whole populations of people. Yeah. So, you know, it's not minimizing that, but it is saying that that really teaches you what matters to you. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a great saying that you can have accountability without annihilation. And I think because we don't tend to have a lot of grace for our own pains, for our own mistakes, we don't know how to have grace for other people's and while I certainly agree with the idea that people need to be held accountable 100%, um, we don't really live in a culture that believes in restoration. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so if we don't model that for people outside of us, how are we going to treat ourselves? Yep. You know, when we make a mistake, 
are we actually going to look to learn from it or are we going to bury it deep in the shadows and you know everything you bury just reroutes and gets stronger and comes out in a different way so, true. so that's a long answer to yeah but i think that's that's love. really powerful you know talking about yeah you know, unconditional love doesn't mean it looks as i think we have this idea that unconditional love is only has to look a certain way. And what you're saying is actually there's so much love in endings. There's so much love and change at times, you know, leaving a situation can sometimes be the most loving thing to do, you know, because it empowers that other person to live their truth or, or, you know, and, and so letting go of the, the need for love to fit into a box that we label as romantic relationship or marriage or whatever it might be and say that love defies that. It goes outside the bounds of the boxes that we try to put it in. And it says, you know, I love this part of you too, the part of you that might be leading you away from me, you know, and that's okay. And I can, you know, um, I, it doesn't have to look the way I want it. And so, so many times in my life, I think, life, God has been asking me to learn the lesson of that. I'm, (laughs) I've been in a power dynamic with God so often. I'm trying, I think I know how (laughs) it should be, right? I know the way it, it should be. And, and continually it's like, do you trust me that it might not look the way you think, but it's for your good. It's for your highest. It's for your most authentic expression in truest form to come into being. And right now you might not fully understand that or see how these things are all going to tie in and how these are all puzzle pieces to a beautiful uh, masterpiece. But one day you will. And as long as I'm trying to make it and force it to be the way I want it to be, even in my, especially in my relationships, then I'm no longer accessing the divine intelligence and divine love that really wants to move me towards more love in my life, not take it away from me, you know? And often at times we think, oh, well, God or the universe or whatever made me go through this thing and it took love away. Well, what if it's actually trying to add more love to your life? Um, you just are having a hard time seeing that sometimes. Mm. Mm. Isn't that such, it's like the majority of our suffering comes from wanting things to be different. Yeah. But when you want things to be different, you can't change them. Because you're resistant to the very, it's like the lesson will keep coming and surrender. Mm-hmm. So you can surrender, then you can change things. Yep. You know, I mean, that's a, I feel like that's the never ending um, cosmic two by four <laughs> that, that, you know, I've, I relate to as well. Mm-hmm. It's like the lessons always get bigger, they get deeper. And it's of my opinion that, all of these things are just inviting you to come more alive. Mm-hmm. Like they're just inviting you to take up more space. They're inviting you to build more discernment. Uh, you know, as you said at the beginning, it's like real life can have happened to us. You can be a victim of circumstances, but you still are the one who has to decide what you're going to do with it. Mm-hmm. And resigning to your life is not going to be doing anything about it. It's like if I make the breakup mean I can never be happy again, then I prove to nobody. But what I really want to prove is how hurt I was. And they're going to see how depressed I am. And look at all the things that you did that caused me to never be happy again. Mm -hmm. It's like that's not... First off, that there's no revolution in that. Mm-hmm. That's resignation yep. and that's helplessness. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying like, use the grief of your experience to be like, never again. Grief is the most potent transformational tool we have available to us. Yep. And I was just telling this to my community over this week, yesterday, actually on our call. It's like... <sighs> One of the definitions that I really relate to and resonate with for grief is sometimes grief feels like love with nowhere to go. Mm. But what happens when you take all of that love that you've been pointing in someone else's direction and you turn it towards yourself, you know? Right. It can completely change and transform your life. And, and that's the alchemy that I feel like I've been doing so often um, over the years. It's like, 
when I feel that grief and that longing to like have that person or that dynamic back, I'm like, how can I turn this inward on myself and give it a place to go? Because it's not like the love goes away. The love doesn't die. You don't lose the love. The love, I used to think that the love was in that person. Well, no, the love was in me. (laughs) And Mm. that person was helping to bring that out of me, but I still have that love. You know, right. And what am I going to do with it? And where am I going to, what am I, you know, am I going to bury it? Am I going to, or am I going to use it? Um, and love is really what heals us, you know? Um, and that's what I think you're doing such a powerful and beautiful job with obviously your work and your podcast, but really with this book, Liberated Love and giving people a real chance at experiencing the love um, that we all crave, that we all desire. We all have the same similar needs, you know, and love and belonging is certainly at the top of that list. And you're giving people hope again and a real path forward to having, um, having the types of relationships that, that we want most. And so I want everybody to go get a copy. How can people go find liberated love and get access to that for themselves? I know you've got, I think a couple giveaways if they get it in a certain place. So can you tell people where they can grab that? Yeah. So if you go, first off, thank you for having me on and thank you to you listening or watching just for trading your time for this. That means the world to me. Mm -hmm. Um, you can go to create the love.com slash liberated love. And, uh, if you, there's all the links to wherever you want to buy it and you could put in your order number and you'll get a meditation that we have Mm -hmm. and a workbook that goes along with that. And, uh, yeah, the audio book, Kylie and I actually, speak about each chapter after each chapter. So we have like a little conversation, which is great. Oh, I love that. I definitely want to get that. I really love when authors read the book and have that kind of discussion. So make sure you guys go to create the love.com slash liberated love. We'll put that in the show notes as well as how you can follow Mark. I know I've heard you're getting off Instagram soon. So we're going to make sure to put your YouTube and other social media platforms where you can continue to get all of your content because we want people to stay connected to you. Um, and I just appreciate you. appreciate Appreciate you for the way you show up and your wisdom, sharing your story, sharing your experience so that we can see a little bit more of ourselves through your story. And I know that's what happened on the show, the show and this conversation. So thank you. Uh, until next week, you guys go apply what you heard, maybe go get yourself a copy, get copies for your friends, for your family, for your partner. Um, cause what a gift it is to experience true love and intimacy. We all deserve it. We'll see you next week on the coachable podcast.